Welcome to episode 46 of the Empowering Ability Podcast. Welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast, where we get you and your loved ones impacted by disability the information needed to live a full and meaningful life. Now here's your host, Eric Gall. Hey friends, welcome to the podcast. A few quick housekeeping things before we get started today. Uh, I first want to just let you know that I've recently moved and why that's important for you to know is it does impact or it is impacting the audio quality of these podcasts slightly. Uh, Trying to figure out the best setup here in my new home to uh, record these podcasts to get you the best possible audio quality. So uh, I appreciate the patience that you that you have while uh, I work through some of these more technical things. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is on previous episodes, I mentioned that I'm thinking about ways that uh, you'd be able to contribute to the podcast if that's something of interest to you and and if you're getting value from the the, uh, podcast episodes and the guests. So that's something that I'm still working on. So sit tight. Uh, I will have something coming with that on the in the coming months. So for today's episode, my guest is Brian Raymond King. And Brian is a coach that resides out of the Illinois area in the United States. And Brian is not only a coach, but also a student of adversity. Uh, He's been through multiple different challenges in his life, many of those health related. And that's where he tends to focus uh, his coaching, uh, supporting people uh, that are going through health challenges, uh, many including ADHD, which he talks a lot about a lot on his platforms. Uh, Facebook is a big platform for him. So uh, Brian shares his story uh, and we talk a lot about uh, resiliency and bouncing back from challenges in your life, uh, what tools we have in our toolkits to be resilient and to um, face these challenges and some strategies when, you know, things are, are, you know, might seem overwhelming or might seem too much. Uh, and we talk about, um, hacking resiliency, Brian calls it. So excited to, uh, to share this with you and I hope you enjoy. Here's Brian. Hey, Brian, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Eric. It's uh, a pleasure having you on today. So uh, we've got Brian King with us today. Brian is a coach and a resilience hacker. So excited to, to talk about those things with uh, with Brian and uh, definitely topics interest of interest to me and, and many of you uh, listeners. Um, and coaching isn't something that we've talked too much about the, on the podcast, but um, as a lot of you know, I'm a coach and, uh, and Brian's an awesome coach as well. So excited to dive into those things. But Brian, maybe we can start off just, I want to hand you the mic and, and let you share a little bit about your story and your journey. Well, I've been uh, a student of adversity pretty much since the beginning of my life, that is. I grew up with undiagnosed ADHD, dyslexia, and a degree of Asperger's, which is a form of autism. I had uh, stage three testicular cancer when I graduated high school. I was been socially awkward pretty much my entire life. Got much better over the years. Got married and divorced. Became a single father of three boys with ADHD and Asperger's. And as of the past five years, I received diagnoses of two chronic conditions. One is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which affects the connective tissue in my joints. So my ligaments and my tendons are very slack. Uh, joints like to slip out of place and get stuck and need to be popped back in. And as of late, multiple sclerosis, which, you know, as I mentioned before we went live, uh, I'm doing from bed today because I'm having a lot of aches and pains and fatigue and I'm having to do a lot of self-care. But thanks to technology, we can still have conversations like this. And the, the long and short of how I make my way with all of this going on is that I look at all of these different challenges as opportunities to be more resourceful as opposed to opportunities to ask why me, play the self-pity game, and feel sorry for myself because I just don't like the results that come from that mindset. 
Yeah. So it sounds like you've been dealt um, an interesting hand in life and uh, a lot of adversity um, that you've gone through along the way, Brian. And I just want to, you know, thank you again for uh, chatting with me today and um, and providing your wisdom and experience and um, value to to our listeners. Even though, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, you're you're in bed and you've got low energy today and. Uh, really practicing some self-care. So, um, yeah, just grateful that you're spending the time with, with us today. Oh, my pleasure, man. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's, it's a matter of doing what you can with what you got. You know, I know that's a bit of a cliche saying, but in situations like mine and other entrepreneurs I know that have different chronic conditions, you don't just give up on life and let it pass you by because you can't do everything each day that you can do on your best day. You know, because there are some people that, that use that as their standard. On their very best day, that's how they should do it all the time. That's just ridiculous. You know, life ebbs and flows. We can't do that. So each day is pretty much an assessment of where is my body at? Where's my brain at? Is it foggy? Is it sharp as a tack? And depending on that, what can I reasonably provide that day as best I can? What can I show up 100% for so that people are served instead of saying, I'm going to put in a full day and it's all going to be mediocre, you know? I'd rather put in a couple things that are really kick butt and then step back and take care of myself. Right, right. Yeah, what are the, what are the most important things to do today? Invest in those and then make sure you're taking care of yourself. I love that. Right. You were you were mentioning that um, you know through all of these different challenges that you've you've got through uh, or you, you've worked through or you're you know experiencing um, you've looked for opportunities to be more resourceful right instead of getting down on yourself like oh why me right so uh, two very different mindsets and it it's I'm curious was there was there a point when you were maybe at maybe there might have been several points but. As far as you can remember back, was there a point where you're like, oh, man, why me? And you had that reframe to, okay, well, what opportunities do I have to be more resourceful? What is the opportunity in this experience that I'm having? Um, I'm just curious, was there, was there a moment that you can put your, your finger on where you changed your mindset to be more resourceful, uh, more creative, rather than kind of playing that um, or being in that more victim of mindset? Well, with each new diagnosis, there was that oh crud moment. Like, you know, how much more am I going to have to deal with for crying out loud? You know, haven't I been dealt enough? And that was brief. Then I'd always come back to the fact that, well, grumping and groaning is not going to change the reality of the situation. So what do I need to know? What information do I need to have? What resources do I need to be in touch with? Who do I need to know? What books do I need to read so that I can learn how to manage this instead of simply succumbing to it or being a statistic? So I don't know that, that there was a single moment. There were some you know, two steps forward, three steps back moments where I would say, okay, I got this, you know, nobody, nothing can stop me. And then I'd be disappointed and I would slide back. So I think after doing that enough times, where I said, okay, what are my resources? What do I need at my disposal? At some point, it just stuck. You know, I'd done it enough times where my brain finally said, you know what, forget the what was me nonsense. You know, we've tried this resourcefulness thing, and I think we have something here. Let's just stick with it. You know what I mean? You, you do it enough times, and your brain just locks into it. For the listeners out there, um if they're going through a, a challenge or an adver ad adversity, what are um, tools that we all have in our toolkit that we either forget that we have or um, maybe aren't even aware, aware of that we have? Well, a lot of what, it's not so much the tools, the tools are there. It's the noise that makes it difficult to use the tools. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the chatter and the negativity between your ears and, one of the worst offenders is the shoulds. You know, this shouldn't be this way. You know, this is not fair. It should be like this. It should be like that. 
And because of all those shoulds, that very idealistic thinking that in many ways says, I should be immune to inconveniences. You know, I shouldn't have problems. Everything should be smooth sailing. And that's what a lot of that shoulding is, if you really pay attention to it. And it's all of that chatter that makes you think that, well, basically, you're sitting there fretting over the fact that the problem exists. That's what a lot of the shooting is. And you're doing nothing about the fact that, okay, the reality is the problem does exist. Now, what steps are you going to take to solve it? And once you get done shooting all over yourself, when you catch yourself doing all that, you can, sim- you can basically say, all right, what is one step that I can take right now to solve this problem? And maybe you don't know what the solution is yet, but thinking that you've got to take at least one step towards it, now you can start problem solving. Thinking, what do you want instead of the problem as it is? The key there is having that switch, right? That that shift in your mindset to being stuck on the problem. To, oh, poor me, why am I in this situation? Or why did this happen to me? To, well, what am I going to do about it? With with either yourself or the clients that you work with, um, how can people? Sh- how how do you coach people to to shift to looking at the problem and taking action? Well, with my clients, when they come to me with whatever the problem is, if they're coming to me very problem focused, oh, this there's one young lady I work with who goes to catastrophe pretty quickly. Say, oh, this is the worst day. I feel miserable. I can't take it anymore. You know, this this is more than I can bear. One thing I'll ask her is, do you honestly believe that? Or is that honestly true? And she'll say, well, maybe it's not true, but it really feels that way. I'll say, great. What's going through your head right now that's helping it feel that way? And I'll get her tuned into her thoughts. And she'll realize all of the chatter that she's using that's making her feel helpless. And I'll ask her the question, do you want to be helpless or do you want to be in charge? So I want to be in charge. Okay, great. What can you take charge of right now? You can take charge of your thoughts. What options haven't you considered? Other ways to deal with this other than just running? Well, you know, I could go to the nurse's office or I could go see my counselor. Or any variety of things. So that's kind of how I walk her through getting herself out of catastrophe and back into solution. Right, right. What comes to mind for me within that is when we're we're thinking about, oh, this could happen, or you know, let's paint the worst case scenario, or we're coming up with all these, you know, should statements or what if statements. Um, one thing that I found effective to ask uh coaches is what assumptions are you making right what are those things that you're you're you maybe you don't have full information on and you're making up in your head that's taking you down these paths and helping that individual to realize that hey these are the stories that I'm creating and this is the self talk that that I've created in my head that might not be true yeah that's an excellent question especially with the what if thing what if this, what if that, what if that other thing? Because and I imagine you've seen this too, is the what ifs aren't necessarily hypothetical in their minds. These are actual expectations. You know, it's not that it might happen. It's that it's likely to happen. And that's why I'm so anxious. And they think that they can predict the future. It's going to happen because I'm worrying it's going to happen. And that, like you said, is an assumption. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and. So, Brian, you talk a lot about um, working on your mindsets before your skill sets. Can you help us understand what that means and and what that looks like? Absolutely. A skill set is basically your ability to use the resources you have in order to accomplish your specific goals. I could, and you could, all day long, give our clients the best tools in the world. 
But if they don't believe in themselves, they may not even use them. And if they do use them, they may give up when they begin to feel successful because they weren't ready for a success. They were expecting failure. Or there'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy, and they'll do it incorrectly just to fail and be able to say, see, I told you, I'm not good at this. So they have got to have a mindset, meaning an arrangement of the beliefs, the values, the attitudes that create states of confidence, motivation, perseverance. If they don't have those first, they are not going to make good use of any of the skills we give them. Mm. So what are what are some ways that people can work on their mindsets and 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 create that foundation for that, you know, positive self-talk and that confidence um to move them forward? Well, one thing I'm a big fan of is studying biographies. Mm-hmm. You can go on YouTube these days and watch interviews of your role models. And don't just listen to what they did, because people get caught up in that. Oh, I wish I could do that. I wish I was the kind of person that could do that thing. Well, the the stuff people are doing doesn't happen in a vacuum. Now, I can't remember who said it, but things are created twice, first in the mind, <clears throat> then in the world. You first imagine it, then you create it. Mm-hmm. Like Star Trek, and, right? <laughs> Star Trek just makes up stuff as it goes along. You know, some of that stuff is so ridiculous, but it's <laughs> but a lot of it, a lot of it's fantasy. a lot of it's come true, right? Well, we're getting there. Yeah, some of it's pretty scary. Yeah, but I'm trying to remember where I was. Uh, you're talking about biography. My ADHD brain gets distracted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, biographies and stuff. It's important to look at the decisions they made and the beliefs they hold. Because it's the beliefs, it's their attitudes, it's their decisions that inform their actions. So you can try and duplicate their actions all day long. You know, fake it till you make it. But if you ultimately don't believe what they believe and think the way they think, you can act it as much as you want to. You're not going to get the same or even similar results. You've got to study belief systems. That's what's ultimately, at least in my experience, made the biggest difference. Mm, I like that. So imitating the belief systems and the attitudes of those that that you admire. More than imitation, adaptation. So take a belief in, and then once you get it in your head, do a little exercise that says, okay, for today, I'm going to act as though this is true. That this belief is true. I'm going to see the world through the lens of this belief. And if you act as though it's true, everything you do changes. Like if you have the belief that people are good at heart, you will walk around a day saying hi to more people, shaking more hands, as opposed to the belief that says, ah, people are just out to screw over. People can't be trusted. You're a much different person. Yeah, with that one belief. Yeah. So find one one belief that you want to try on and begin with that one. Sometimes a single belief is all it takes. But imagine, imagine rather, accumulating a lot of really powerful beliefs. Can you share... That just changes everything. Yeah, for sure. Can you share a uh, maybe a, a biography that you read or... Uh, an inspirational person that you look up to and, and who you studied and maybe a belief from them that you adopted and, and how that changed the game for you? Oh, yeah, Viktor Frankl. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I read his book, uh, The Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. Yes. Yeah. And the one thing in that book that really has just stood the test of time with me, it's, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. That, but he essentially said that you can choose your attitude no matter how difficult your circumstances. Mm-hmm. And anybody that comes to me today crying about their life, because keep in mind, I'm dealing with people that are in the first world. People whose problems would be a dream to people in the third world. And they're complaining about things. And I will say to them, 
you know, especially if they're inflexible, they won't let go of that narrative that their life is terrible. Say, go and read Man's Search for Meaning and come back to me. And if you think that your life still stinks after reading that, then I'll know you didn't read it. Right. For, for people that haven't read the book, Brian, uh, basically, Victor ended up in a concentration camp uh, in, was it Germany or Poland during World War II? I'm, I'm not sure which camp he was in. I think it might have been Auschwitz, but yeah. don't quote me on that. I think you're right, yeah. Um, and, and essentially, he finds purpose within his life still living in that absolutely terrible environment. And that basically helps him uh, find inner peace and have the will to survive that experience. And what he basically determined is that each person has the internal power and resources to find meaning in any situation. And it was because he and some of the people that he was in the camp with declared, not found, not that they said, oh, this was sent down from the heavens to happen to me because it's the purpose of my life. He realized, no, I declared meaning that this means something to me and this is how I'm going to endure it. In his case, the meaning he found was I need to survive this so I can tell my story so that this will never happen again in human history. And he declared that for himself. And if each person realizes that, if they're sitting around thinking, well, I know my life has some meaning, in some meaning, I just have to find it. No, you've got to find it. Declare it. What do you want your life to mean? What do you want it to stand for? Once you decide that, start creating it. And maybe down the road, your mind will change about what the meaning is. But until then, you're creating something. And how did that, that book, or how did Viktor Frankl um, change the game for you? Well, because he, he gave me perspective on just how much I was self-pitying. You know, I think I came across his book when I was still recovering from uh, my cancer back when I was 18, feeling really sorry for myself, comparing me, me and my life to my peers who, in my mind, you know, I was assuming that their lives were all worry-free and they were off living the good life and everything. You know, a lot of assumptions, a lot of projection, and just really self-torturing myself. And then reading his book really just slapped me in the face with the reality that I decide how I'm going to think, how I'm going to feel. There's nothing about my situation that mandates I be miserable just because I had cancer and that my friends are off living a different life, none of that is relevant to how I choose to think. Like I said, you know, if you keep your, if you keep your same mindset after reading that book, it means you didn't read it. <laughs> right. And Because and, it's and, very, very hard to maintain your, your BS after you've read that book. Right. And at, at that point, when you finished reading the book, did you uncover or start to think about what the the meaning and the purpose of your life is? Well, at that point, I just knew I needed to start getting more control of my thinking back and not be so reactive and not be so blaming and so angry. So I wouldn't say it was like it transformed me overnight or anything, but it definitely set me off in a much more deliberate direction. I wasn't waiting for meaning to fall out of the sky. I'd say I was pretty much committed at that point to tame the noise that was in my head. I got into Buddhist meditation, started reading a lot more about Zen, reading a lot of self-help books. I went to school for social work. So the, I say my life since then has been very heavy on personal reflection, you know, learning how to get out of my own way instead of allowing some very comforting BS to float around in my head to make me feel comfortable because if it was at the expense of me seeing things clearly, I wasn't interested in it. I wanted to get that nonsense out of my head. Yeah. So I think anybody listening to this podcast obviously uh, knows that you're a fan of Viktor Frankl and, and I am as well. So yeah. Man's Search for Meaning uh, definitely recommended read especially if you're experiencing any type of challenge and want a bit of perspective. So, Brian, one of the other things that you focus on, or and we've kind of touched on a little bit, of, is resiliency. Um, is there any tips or insights that you have for folks around 
um, hacking their own resiliency and, and, and boosting their resiliency? Now, one thing to understand, at least from my definition, is a hack is finding a loophole. You know, where when you think of like computer hacking or whatever, you think the, the wall is ironclad, nobody can get through it, and then your hacker comes in and finds a loophole or a little gap or an exception. So look at your beliefs that are very all or nothing. This is the way it always is. This is the way it never is. This is unchanging. Find yourself a situation where that's simply not true. Find a loop. Because if you say to yourself, oh, you know, my life is always going to be miserable, or I'm, well, I have depression. I've been diagnosed depressed, so I'm always going to be depressed. Oh, you've always, always going to be depressed? Was there ever a time that you were happy? Well, yeah, there was one time, bam, we got a hack. We just found a loophole in there. If you were happy, how'd you do it? Okay, you, you thought this way, you were around these people, you were in this activity, great. If you did it once, you can do it again. So let's create a new pattern where there's a lot more happiness than that belief that I'm always going to be depressed just disintegrates. So finding that, that moment in time where that, you know, in this example, looking at depression, right? So looking at, at for moments in time where you felt happiness, right? What were you doing? What were you thinking? Where were you? Who were you there with? And deconstruct that, right? To, to understand the elements of it and where that happiness was being driven from. And then how can you, how can you scale that or how can you repeat it? Yeah, and it's like just looking at the recipe, what things need to be put together in what order in order for you to be happy. And in many cases, it doesn't have to be all of the things that happen together. When you break it down, you maybe realize that at the, the bottom of all of that was just some simple gratitude. Because with that activity, with all those different elements, you are just reminded that there are still some good things in your life. So maybe you don't necessarily need that entire activity. You just need to introduce a new habit in your life called a gratitude journal. Or at the end of the day, if you say prayers or if you like to end your day with a little positive phrase, list the things you're grateful for for the day. That alone, tapping into some gratitude every day, is really enough to keep you out of the dumps. Right. And there's a lot of science around gratitude and, and how it increases your, your happiness as well. So uh, I'm just thinking in terms of hacks, have you played around with, I guess, doing some inverse thinking? So for the example with depression, asking the question, well, if I want to be depressed, what do I need to do? Right, like if I want to cause oh, myself yeah. to be I, depressed, that's how I. That's what I do when I'm working with a client who insists that they're not doing, they're not contributing to it in any way. That it's just the way it is. I'm just depressed, or I'm just sad, or I'm just afraid, I'm just anxious. That's just the way it is. Then I'll kind of turn it over to them and say, "Great, if I wanted to be anxious just like you, where would I start?" And at first, they think I'm crazy. And then when they think about it, they start to realize they're doing some very specific things. You almost see the half grin on their face. Like, uh-oh, you got me. Right. Well, this is how I'm contributing to it. Yeah, but they, it can also be a very empowering moment for them when I'm like, holy cow, I got more say in this than I thought I did. And that smile is almost like that, that sense of joy, that, that ray of light, you know, that, the light at the end of the tunnel. That's like the, the light peeking through the tunnel, or you find that little loophole, that little hack, and you open it up a little wider, and a little light comes through. Yeah, and I think that there's some interesting perspectives and questions that we've been kind of asking back and forth at each other that, that, um, that we either use for ourselves or we use with our, our clients that are you know valuable for for listeners to take away and ask themselves or ask uh, other people in their lives that uh, that they love and and that they're supporting so brian is there anything else that you want to that comes to mind for you in terms of what you would like to to share with with listeners one thing i can't emphasize enough is the importance of allowing yourself to be human Yes, we are bombarded every single day, depending on what different media outlets you watch. We're bombarded with messages that our life isn't good enough. 
that we are not good enough until we have the best phone and the, the shiniest hair or the, the fastest downloads. And the reality is that life is perfect. We are perfect. Not perfect in that there are no flaws, but perfect in that everything is working as it needs to. What really gets in the way and causes us to be miserable is when we're saying, this is wrong, this isn't good enough, this is not valuable. Basically, all of our judgments upon things. And the solution isn't to stop judging. We judge. We compare. That's what our brain does. The solution is isn't catching yourself when you do it and saying, that's not true. I'm not going to spend any time with that. I'm going to let that thought go because it stands in the way of me being grateful for this moment as it is. And to me, it sounds like acceptance is, is within that as well. Accepting who we are, what our makeup is, um, and also accepting the gifts that we have and, and giving those to the world, right? Like, I know that I'm not going to be a, uh, you know, I'm not going to win the gold medal for the 100 meter. But I know that, you know, for me, a gift is to be able to connect with people and to help them to find their own path and to, and to uh, you know, design their life and, and create a fulfilling life, right? I know that's, that's my lane. Um, so I'm not going to get, uh, you know, I'm not going to judge myself based on not being able to run the 100 meter in under 10 seconds. Right. And hopefully you don't judge yourself with that and you realize that that's not what you were put in this world to do. Right. Um, are there any maybe final thoughts or questions or even a challenge that you want to leave for the folks listening? Yeah. One challenge I give you is whenever a problem shows up, one question you can ask yourself is what's good about this? So that you immediately begin seeing what opportunities are available to you because that problem exists. Right. And it flips you into a different, different type of thinking, right? Because the problems in front of us, we typically start going down the rabbit hole in terms of, you know, oh, what are the negatives? Like, what are the, the consequences of this? And what are the negative things for me? But we rarely do that thinking around, oh, well, what opportunities are there? Yeah, and that's the power of that question is you can shift very quickly. Right, right. I love it. All right, Brian, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. How can folks reach out to you? How can folks uh, learn more about you and, you know, connect in with your content? Two main ways. You can go to my website, which is mindsetbeforeskillset.com, or just look me up on Facebook. I'm very easy to find. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll make sure that we link to both your website and your Facebook page so folks can easily find you in the show notes and on the short blog that uh, goes along with the podcast. So um, yeah, Brian, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and look forward, looking forward to the next time we chat. Likewise, Eric. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. A big thanks to Brian for coming on the podcast today. Uh, some of the main takeaways for me is that we shouldn't be shooting all over ourselves and we shouldn't be thinking about all the shoulds, right? So we, we often create all these stories in our heads and they tend to be quite negative that push us into a state of uh, stress and anxiety. And the key is to think about what reality actually is and, and, and accepting that and thinking about how to move forward and what's that first small step towards moving forward. So uh, I really agree with with Brian's thoughts around that. And if if you agree with that as well, and you like what Brian was talking about, you can check him out on Facebook. If you just search for Brian Raymond King, uh, that's uh, Brian's main platform there. So uh, want more from Brian, check him out there. And in a couple of weeks coming up on our next episode, we have guest Michael Kendrick. And Michael is a international, uh, I think most people would classify him as an expert on disability. So really excited to have Michael uh, Kendrick on the show. We talk about how people with disabilities have lived historically, how they're living today, and what we've learned uh, throughout 
time. And Michael shares what we have learned and shares that there are better ways to do things than we've done in the past. We get into conversations around uh, how there's historically been very low expectations on people with disabilities and, and how they're viewed as different or, or subhuman and how we can think about how we can start to change that. And we talk about group homes and, and better ways of, of living than in group homes as well. So a really interesting conversation. Uh, I think you'll enjoy Michael's perspective. So join us in a couple of weeks for that conversation. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Uh, if you like this episode and you think you know someone that would benefit, please share it with them. Uh, be a part of the change to think differently about disability. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. Visit us at empoweringability.org for more podcasts and resources to help you and your loved ones impacted by disability build a full and meaningful life.